you ever been in a situation where you were speaking the truth, but nobody was listening? Listen, a worldwide global flood is coming and everybody's going to drown who does not get into the ark. And, and nobody believes him. They mock him. Imagine a hundred years of preaching and at the end of it, nobody has bought it. Let me say here at this point that Noah is a man of great faith. Not because people responded to his voice, but because he responded to God's voice. It must have been incredibly difficult for Noah. He was responsible for building an ark to rescue his family. He was trying to preach the truth and encourage anyone who would listen to join them. And even when Noah and his family boarded the ark, they weren't walking away from their trials. The jeers of those who heckled him were replaced with thunder and lightning. And the pain of living with unbelievers was doubled by the heartbreak of knowing that they were being destroyed. Even though nobody outside of Noah's family responded to the truth, Noah was faithful, and God commends him for that faithfulness. Today, Stephen looks at what really made Noah's obedience to God so heroic. Let's get started. Now, in this session, I want to make two more observations about this man's faith. So if you turn to Hebrews chapter 11, the first thing I want you to notice is that Noah's faith is going to be demonstrated by perseverance in the midst of mockery. If you look at chapter 11 and go back to verse 7, we're told, by faith Noah being warned by God about things not yet seen and reverence prepared, prepared an ark for the salvation of his household. Now notice, by which he condemned the world and became an heir of righteousness, which is according to Faith. In other words, Noah's actions are going to reveal his genuine faith in the Word of God, which would be the gospel. And his actions, did you notice? By them, he condemned the world. Now let's think about that for a moment. Genesis informs us that for a hundred years, Noah is building the ark. He's periodically preaching to the crowds that come to mock him. I mean, can you see him turning around on that scaffolding and it's four stories high and periodically preaching to them, inviting them to be saved from the wrath of God and, and that those who don't will perish in a coming flood? I mean, can you imagine how foolish that must have sounded to his generation? He got this 18,000 ton barge sitting in your back pasture. That was going to be on everybody's radar. I mean, this is going to be on Ripley's Believe It or Not tour. You could just see tour buses pulling up if they had tour buses. I mean, everybody's got to see this. And can you imagine the conversation? What are you doing, Noah? I'm building an ark. Well, what's an ark? Well, I've never seen one before, but according to the blueprints, it's flat bottom barge, kind of like a raft with sides and a roof. And it's going to float on a flood. Oh, going to float on water. Yes. Noah, you're 100 miles away from the nearest body of water. Well, God will bring the water. Okay. If he does, let's just assume he does. Why is it so big? Well, it's got to be this big because uh, it's going to hold up a a pair of every species of land animal, which breathes through the nose or nasal passages. Oh, and you're going to round them all up. No, God's going to do that. How? I don't, I don't know. I'm not sure. Well, how are you going to take care of thousands of animals on that boat? Well, I really don't know that either. What about us? You know, people, we breathe through our nose too, except during hay fever season. What about us? Well, you're invited to come and join me. There's plenty of room for hundreds, if not several thousand that I'm hoping will believe. And what if we don't? You'll die. Oh, well, who said that? God did. You mean everybody that doesn't buy your story about this boat and animals 
and a flood is going to be killed by the judgment of God. Well, that's right. And you can imagine at that moment, you know, the, the tone of the conversation is going to change. Why? Because Noah is delivering a message of potential judgment by God upon people we've already been told do not care about God. Genesis chapter 6 and verse 5 has already informed us that the thoughts and plans of everyone was entirely given over to evil continually. That's the description of Noah's generation. Try warning your world the way Noah warned his. The Apostle Peter informs us that the next worldwide cataclysm is going to be not water, but what? Fire. The end of human history, fire is going to destroy the earth and God's going to remake a new heaven and a new earth, 2 Peter chapter 3. And then just before the, the creation of this new world, judgment's going to take place and all who refuse to believe the gospel message will be cast into an eternal lake of fire. You mean to tell me that a billion Muslims and two billion plus Hindus and a lot of other people are going to face the judgment of God if they don't believe your gospel? Is that what you're saying? No. That's what God said. And I'm just repeating his warning. You see, it's actually easy to miss the fact that Noah was a messenger of rescue. It's actually easy to miss the fact that everything Noah is doing is calculated to save, not condemn. But you see, the gospel has two sides to it. One of rescue, and then the other, obviously, if you're not rescued, judgment. Listen, a worldwide global flood is coming, and everybody's going to drown who does not get into the ark. And, and nobody believes him. Nobody beyond his immediate family. They mock him. Imagine a hundred years of preaching, and at the end of it, nobody has bought it. Let me say here at this point that Noah is a man of great faith. Not because people responded to his voice, but because he responded to God's voice, right? Are you willing to persevere in your faith even when surrounded by mockery? Are you willing to be a lonely man, a lonely woman, or a young person? Do you understand that even though your message is an invitation to rescue, it's also a message that surfaces sin and causes people to confront their guilt? Do you understand that you expose people when you shine the light? I felt sorry for that one little kid. He was standing right in front of that speaker, and the whole time he's got his ears closed. Man, he put him right there. That's the world. You you put a light right in front of their eyes and it hurts. That's what you do. You not only show the way, but you bother people with the message you're delivering. Alcibiades was a brilliant yet ungodly young man living in Athens during the days of Socrates, around around 400 years before the birth of Christ. And one day, Alcibiades said to Socrates, Socrates, I hate you so, for every time I meet you, you show me what I am. Historians say that one of the godliest men who lived in Athens was a man by the name of Aristides. He was even nicknamed Aristides the Righteous. Eventually, however, the leading citizens just didn't want him around. In fact, the court of Athens voted to exile him, to send him away. And One of the men was asked why he so voted that way, and he responded, because I am tired of hearing Aristides called righteous. What does that make me? Are you willing to stand alone? Are you willing to persevere in your faith even in the midst of mockery? Have you ever been called goody, two-shoes? You know that phrase, I don't know why it came back to me um, when I was studying this text. 
some ancient Hebrew probably manuscript I was reading, but at any rate, goody two shoes just came to my mind. And I thought about that. You know, it receives the scorn of people. It's kind of a deriding comment toward people, godly people, good people. I had no idea where the phrase came from, so I did a little digging and found that it originated in a children's story about a little orphan who only had one shoe. It was all tattered and beat up. A wealthy man in kindness gave this little orphan girl a pair of beautiful new shoes, and, and she was so changed because of this gracious gift that she wanted to live up to her new shoes, for her life to match her shoes. And so people would refer to her not in a deriding fashion, but simply as, there she goes, goody two-shoes. She was so remarkably changed after receiving the gift. And I couldn't help but think, obviously, shouldn't we all? Having been given by our Father the gift of forgiveness, the shoes of the gospel, should we not live up to them? But when we do, remember, the danger of a godly life is it means exposure to your world. You live an ethical life and and it may not be appreciated. You do the right thing, and it may not be applauded. You might be a lonely man or woman. As a freshman, getting a job, working on an assembly line, making microwaves, they'd come down this assembly line, this conveyor belt, and I was given the job of a guy. They moved to another part of the line, and, and the job was just to simply take a little motor and attach a couple of brackets to it and stick a fan on it and bolt it down and then hand it to the assembly line. And uh, I watched this man do it, and, and uh, I was kind of nervous because he got it done just in time to hand it to the, the, the guy on the, on the line. And I thought, man, I'm, I'm not going to be able to keep up. And so for the first hour, I'm just kind of sweating it, and I finally figured out if I reposition the stock a certain way, and I can limit my movements for efficiency, and I could get this thing done. And I found that, that halfway through my shift, I was getting way ahead. In fact, I had gotten to the point where I had stacked on top of my desk these motors. And for the rest of my shift, I, it, was, it was just boring. I just stood there and handed them to this guy and realized that what I could do is position them so all he had to do was just turn and grab it whenever he wanted to grab it. And I went down the line to help people that needed help. I, I didn't know that the guy whose place I'd taken was absolutely infuriated with what I had naively exposed. He had made it seem like he could just get it done in time. I'll never forget, he came over to me. At one point, his face was beet red, and he said, Why are you trying to make me look so bad? And I was stunned. I, I didn't know what to say. It, that thought hadn't crossed my mind. You know, later on, I wanted to walk over to him and say, Hey, you're a lion. Every time you show up to work, why don't you get busy, you lazy sluggard? But I didn't. He was bigger than I was, and so I just kept my mouth shut. <laughs> Listen, you do the right thing, and sometimes it backfires. You're going to make waves. You live a life of of honesty and and purity and and, and trust in Christ. You, you, You demonstrate that kind of faith, and then you're going to need to get ready to demonstrate that faith in the midst of those waves you have created. Faith demonstrates perseverance in the midst of mockery. Let me make another observation about faithful Noah. Secondly, faith is demonstrating patience in the midst of silence. Now, I don't want you to underestimate the task God called Noah to do just because we know the end of the story. Yeah, big boat, you know, animals, flood, great, everything worked out. Now, slow down. God is asking Noah to believe in something that's never happened He's asking Noah to buy into something that is unimaginable. And here's the point that is so staggering uh, to me. For the most part, after the initial visit by God, where God gives him instructions, tells him about the flood that's coming and the animals and gives him the blueprint, for the most part, after that initial meeting then, in fact, from that point until 100 years later, Noah has no 
further word or visit from God. Now, I don't know about you, but if I had been put in that predicament, I'd like God to show up at least once a year, you know, on the anniversary of his first visit. Hang in there, Stephen. You you can do it. I'm going to keep my word. I mean, at least a year out, maybe five, ten would be nice. A hundred. A hundred years. It's remarkable to me to think that he did this when God was silent. And then we have the record of God coming at the end of a hundred years when you get to chapter 7 of Genesis and God tells Noah to enter the ark with his family and they obey. And then most people don't read far enough to get this. They, they're told to wait in the ark for seven more days of silence. We're not told why there's seven days. Could have been a period of mourning for the death of the patriarch whose death would bring the judgment. We don't know if they were mourning Methuselah's death. Seven days. Can you imagine the neighbors? Come the animals. No one, the family, get on. They get on. Door shuts. Day one, nothing. Day two, nothing. Day three, nothing. Day four. Day five. Day six. By now, the neighbors, you know, they got a barbecue going outside the ark and And they're playing badminton and volleyball. And can you imagine the Noah jokes? Can you imagine the flood jokes? Can you imagine the blasphemy against the God of Noah? And they're sitting in the ark. We have every reason to believe, according to Scripture, it was nothing but silent. And then some raindrops begin to fall and dance off the sand next to people mocking and sizzle off the top of that barbecue grill. And people looked up. And then according to the Hebrew text, what we do know is that suddenly the springs of water under the earth's surface erupted. And the judgment of God came. Now, since the lens of our focus isn't on the flood but on Noah, let me fast forward the DVD to the end of the flood and turn over to Genesis 9. Noah picks up life back on the planet. He exits the ark, goes back to farming. God not only records the successes of biblical heroes, he records their sins. In Genesis chapter 9, we read... The first mention in the Bible of the word wine. And at its introduction, it means trouble. In verse 20, we're told, Noah began farming and planted a vineyard. He drank of the wine and became drunk. Now, there are some commentators that I read that said, well, poor Noah didn't know what he was doing and, and uh, you know, just drank too much. No, I think he knew what he was doing. He got drunk and uncovered himself in the tent. In his drunkenness, he just shed his clothes and in an embarrassing display. Ham, the father of Canaan, verse 22, saw the nakedness of his father and told his two brothers outside. But Shem and Japheth took a garment and laid it upon both their shoulders and walked backward and covered the nakedness of their father. The key to understanding this text is that Noah's Failure is going to reveal the condition of his three sons' hearts. That's all it does. In other words, that for some time he had evidently resented his father's faith and his walk, and now he sees his father's failure, and instead of helping, his father retains some modicum of, of dignity. He rejoices in it, and he goes out without helping his dad, and he says to his brothers, Hey, this is great! You won't believe it. Look at what old dad's doing. And he mocks him. It's interesting to me that all of the human race descends from not only Adam, but Noah. Right? And both Adam and Noah sinned while partaking of fruit. Noah, the fruit of the vine, and Adam, the fruit of the tree. 
And as a result, each of them became naked and had to be covered by someone else. And their actions will lead to a curse, and mankind has been affected in some way ever since. While I'm on this thought of analogy, let me give you some relative to the Ark of Noah and the Gospel of Christ before we wrap it up. First, if you study the story, you'll know, in fact, we looked at this text in Genesis 6-8, I believe, where we're told that Noah found grace in the eyes of God. I love that phrase. He found grace in the eyes of God. It was because of the grace of God that Noah found his place of safety on that ark, rescued from the coming wrath of God. So we also find our place in Christ, the ark of our salvation. How? By grace alone. We are rescued by grace in Christ, and the coming wrath of God will not touch us, right? Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. There's another. The ark uh, symbolized God's atoning work for mankind. In fact, if we had taken just a little more time, which we didn't, but I want to bring out this one particular fact, the Hebrew word for pitch, that tar-like substance that Noah was commanded to cover uh, the ark with. It's the same root word, kafir, used for atonement. In the sacrificial system later, that's the word used. In a very real way, the word atonement first appears in the Bible in relation to Noah's ark. In the ark, mankind is covered from the wrath of God. Here's another analogy. The ark was strong enough to handle the waves and the storm that pounded against it for more than a year. Jesus Christ is strong enough to carry us safely through the storms, not only of life, but protect us from the storm of God's wrath. He is our shelter. No matter what winds may blow, he is our ark of safety. And there's another came to my mind in studying this. There was only one door into that ark. There's only one way in. Only one way to safety as the judgment of God came. Unlike rabbinical legends we talked about earlier uh, today, you know, Noah wasn't feeding a guy out on the rung of the ladder with a hole he punched through the ark to feed king, the king uh, Gog and, and his sons. No. There's only one door and you had to go in to be saved. There's only one door that leads to everlasting safety from the wrath of of God. Jesus said, I am the way, say it with me, the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except by me. John chapter 14, verse 6. Jesus Christ said, I am the door. If anyone enters through me, he will be saved. John 10, 9. Have you been saved? Well, the answer to that is, have you gone through the door? Of Christ. Have you entered through the door into the one who is both the door and the ark of your salvation? I can remember knowing full well that I was not saved. As a teenager, I didn't want to give my life to Jesus Christ, but I knew I wasn't safe either. I knew enough about the Bible. In fact, I believed the Bible was true, and that's what scared me. Because I knew it was true. I knew that Christ could come at any moment for his church to rapture it away, First Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 17. And I was, I was afraid. I was terrified of being left behind. Left behind as God began to pour out on the earth his bowls of judgment that occupy most of the book of Revelation. Revelation 3.10 all the way through chapter 19. And I was afraid because I knew I was not safe. As a teenager, I would get out of bed at night and tiptoe down the hallway and look in on my little brothers who shared a room. I would quietly open the door to see if I could make out the silhouette of their bodies. 
And then when I could, I'd tiptoe back down the hallway into my bedroom and try to sleep. You enter the ark by faith in Christ because of the grace of God, and you are not only saved, think of it this way, you are also safe. Let me give you two final timeless truths from the biography of this hero of faith. First of all, faith is trust in the Word of God even when it seems impossible. Even when it seems impossible. Beloved, faith is not a leap into the dark. It is walking in the light of God's Word even when all around you grows dark. Secondly, faith is obedience to the will of God even when it requires everything. There was no middle ground for Noah. It was all or nothing. And he gave everything. Amy Carmichael, that Irish missionary to India for some 60 years, in fact, once she got over there, she never came back. She said, there is much talk in the church, but so much shallow living. And she would write, and I quote her, I wonder if it's because there are so few who are prepared to be like a pine tree on a hilltop, alone in the wind for God. That is the testimony of this hero of faith. Faith, beloved, as demonstrated in this man's life, is perseverance in spite of the scorn of unbelievers and the silence, for the most part, the silence of God. That was Stephen Davey with today's Bible lesson from the life of Noah, a lesson called The Lonely Man. Living a life of faith doesn't mean living a life that's free from doubt or discouragement. If you haven't already done it, I encourage you to open up your copy of Heart to Heart magazine and read today's daily devotional. In today's devotional, we reflect a little further on a proper perspective on doubt and discouragement. And if you don't receive Heart to Heart magazine, please give us a call today because we want to make sure to include you in the next issue. You can call us today if you dial 866-48-BIBLE. That's 866-482-4253. Stephen will continue through this series tomorrow, so join us at this same time. 